I, Pragatish Vastva from Marketing and Branding Team of Minimac, welcomes you all to this webinar platform. So today we all are gathered here to, to get the knowledge on the topic, general lubrication system. As we all know, an educate, an educate system needs no contamination. So today you all will get, get to know every and each bit of the general lubrication system. Now, I would like to announce the flow for the webinar. So first we'll have presentation by our respected panelists and, and in between we'll have polls. So please keep your answers ready and give your responses in the poll. And post that, we are going to have a Q&A session in which please post your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. So let's start with an interactive and knowledge packed uh, session on general lubrication system. So welcome our panelists. Uh, I would like to uh, give the platform to Mr. Yogesh Kumar. So hand over to you. Thank you, Pragati. <clears throat> and a warm welcome to all. Today's topic is general lubrication system, which is equally important for all the sector of industry, whether it is cement industry, steel, power, automobile, marine, or whatever it is. So lubrication is a general uh, necessity for any industry, wherever we have dynamic machines, it is rotary or reciprocating, doesn't matter at all. So today we will see uh, the maintenance concept of lubrication and lubrication mechanism to reduce the maintenance cost. Next slide. <clears throat> so a flow of today's presentation will be like this. We will start from the point when the lubricating oil or lube oil enters into the industry and then it goes for storage we do sampling and testing to check its quality then when we have to go for reconditioning or how can we uh, avoid or how can we take longer time for the right of operation of lubricant and then how we can achieve a gray oil to a shining yellow oil or a rusted component to a shiny component. We will see one by one. Okay, let's begin with uh, a poll question. Uh, at which stage contamination is more prone to enter the machine or oil? Like during packing and transportation or during a storage, during oil top up, or during its normal operation. So contamination gets entered into the machine at various stages. So please pull and let's see. Okay, this is very mixed opinion, but certainly we got highest poll for oil top up and which is uh, really a very genuine opinion and thank you for uh, being so honest yes the oil top up is not only the top up process it begins from the storage till oil enters into the machine so what are the uh, existing practices which should not be there and which uh, new practices or better practice we can adapt we will see in upcoming slides. <clears throat> yeah, so let's start with oil reception. So uh, we will go one step behind. So when, <coughs> sorry, when uh, oil is blended in a oil manufacturing plant, it has to be undergo certain processes when base oil is mixed with additives and some uh, 
particular recipe is there under which this oil has to go and this is done in very large size tanks then after blending the oil is stored in large size tank in both the processes air borne particles are very susceptible and they uh, keep on adding with the oil then this uh, bulk oil is transported through bulk containers to the bottling plants <clears throat> whether they get bottled into barrels or small containers then again oil is exposed to air during unloading of the oil then sometime during the bottling process or packaging process so every uh, step there is very bright chance that uh, solid contamination or moisture available in the air will get in contact with the oil and they will degrade the oil cleanliness level so how to check whether uh, our oil which we have received at our end is right or not first of all we can check the labels if they are damaged torn off it shows that handling was not proper or maybe something is tampered then if sticker or label is good we have to check expiry date or date of packaging or formulation because oil uh, even it is not in operation it has shelf life then test certificate we have to ask from the supplier if we simply order the oil they they can supply the oil but they will not provide uh, their uh, test certificate or lab test reports their own so we have to demand those reports and we have to verify that uh, what grade we have ordered uh, the same grade is received and the lab test reports shows that the properties are within the limit then the very important part is basic on site test as soon as we receive a batch of oil immediately uh, we can spend hardly 10 or 15 minute to test the oil quality first we will go for the crackle test it will show the moisture level if there is no crackle we can say that at least moisture level is below 500 ppm then viscosity checking it takes 2 3 minute by viscometer or visco gauge then particle count which says about the mechanical impurity available in the oil so by online particle counters or portable particle counters within a minute we can check what is the ns class or i i so class of that oil and we can match them with the standard test report <clears throat> then it comes to oil storage when we receive the oil we store the barrel or container in the yard sometime in enclosed area and if you see carefully it is written that store in cool and dry place cool means it is not asking about Uh, to store in air conditioned room or something it is there should not be much of temperature variation during its storage life so suppose day and night temperature variation is somewhat 20 25 degree then oil vol volume inside the barrel will expand and contract it will promote the breathing tendency of the barrel so when tank breathes yes it is completely sealed still it breathe if you if you see the carefully that uh, tank cover uh, and cap you will find very tiny hole they are provided for breathing so when tank breathes it uh, inhales the atmospheric air which is having uh, number of uh, different sizes of particles as well as, as well as humidity so 
surrounding air has huge potential to deteriorate the uh, purity level of the oil which we expect uh, in a closed vessel or barrel then it comes to water or rain uh, because if uh, it is not under a shed or in a closed room then rain will come and uh, water will get accumulated on the top of the tank we will see in upcoming slide what is the impact of that Yeah, here we can see that uh, tank top have some uh, like dish shape. So when rain comes, the water gets accumulated on the top. And whenever the barrel breathes, that water will enter into the tank. Even single drop of water can increase PPM level drastically. So when we see that how much it will enter, that quantity is very very negligible compared to our normal quantity we what we see during the rain but for oil that is very high quantity so it is always re recommended that store in the covered area and if possible store the barrel horizontally in nine and three o'clock position means uh, the uh, cap of the barrel should be uh, diametrically apart at nine o'clock and three o'clock position. So oil level will be above that point. So even tank breathe, there will be very, very less chance that air will enter inside the barrel because oil has already covered the inlet point. Then there will be next point. Then what will happen to the barrel? We can say there are ribs in the barrel. They are provided for mechanical expansion. They act like expansion bellows. So this barrel itself has capacity to breathe properly. Even atmospheric air is not allowed to enter. The next point is if at all not possible to store horizontally, then at least tilted position can be achieved. So rainwater will not accumulate on the top of the barrel. The temporary solution may be we can cover uh, the top of barrel with plastic or a lid. Then the walk down inspection, what we call at least daily once we have to take walk down uh, of the storage location or yard to ensure that uh, barrels or containers are stored in the fashion they should be. Next, next slide, please. Yeah. This is very um, commonly we see at site because th theoretically we speak a lot about our lubrication practices, but when it goes down the line, then the bottom most uh, person in the hierarchy who is handling the oil directly with his hand, the effectiveness of all the knowledge or all the standard practices vanishes down or are not 100% uh, effective. So these pictures are taken from various sites and we can say that for, for oil top of what type of container they are using and how they are storing the oil. Because for oil top of, suppose we need five liter of oil. So we will open the barrel and the barrel will remain open till it is not emptied. So it may take day, week or month to consume the entire barrel, but till the time uh, the oil quality will become worse day by day. So some standard practices we must adapt in our plant. First one will be the not to use jute. Jute uh, having a bunch of threads and 
they are susceptible to enter into fine clearances of bearings and uh, reciprocating component and in the later stage if uh, they are accumulated at some critical zone equipment may go for the breakdown then our uh, barrel pumps every grade of oil should have their independent barrel pump dedicated to that grade so cross contamination can be avoided and we have repeatedly said this that 1 liter of injan oil is sufficient to destroy 10000 liters of lube oil that lube oil cannot be reclaimed or recovered or cleaned by any method till date so please take care of this point seriously that every grade of oil should have their uh, independent accessories whether it is barrel pump or top up jar or whatever the component associated with that oil next slide please yeah here we can uh, see some containers these containers are especially designed for oil top up purpose they are hermetically sealed containers we need we, in which uh, we can do contactless oil top up the oil can be sucked in the container without any uh, contact with the oil uh, contact of a human being with the oil and the oil can be delivered to the particular equipment without touching or without involvement of uh, any surrounding air or contamination then uh, you can see these containers are of different colors they are not just uh, for sh show purpose position with proper labels marking level indicators uh, so they give us very prior information and mistake free operation of the lubrication measurement system uh, even uh, in upcoming upcoming slide we will uh, see lube room in detail and uh, the foremost thing the training of technicians we have to train them on the regular basis because as, as time passes the effectiveness of training goes away slowly so we have to uh, keep regular training session for technicians and in every training session they should feel that their knowledge is getting upgraded and it is for the benefit of everyone excellent please okay it's time for one more poll please participate honestly uh, which method do you adopt for varnish testing varnish is a silent killer for uh, lubricant and uh, nowadays it is coming like big challenge as our technology is going high we are going for much more higher pressurized lubrication system then very high temperature operating condition so varnish is a big challenge nowadays especially for the steel plant gas, gas turbines and then super critical turbines and uh, there are certain tests mentioned here like ftir ruler mpc 
so which test uh, we wanted to know you adopt for varnish testing and once varnish enters into the oil it is really a big challenge to remove the varnish yeah methods are available and certainly varnish can be removed so uh, 46% are saying mpc then second one is ftir and the third one is ruler 6% they don't go for varnish testing certainly mpc is very common method for warning testing even ftir and ruler can also detect varnish but mpc is a common method and normally adapted across the industry even uh, at our end we do very frequent mpc during our r&d work and to find a proper uh, varnish removal solution and we are happy to say that yes uh we have that solution that is uh, unique in, in the world <clears throat> next slide please <clears throat> yeah so again uh, coming to our day to day practices one important part of uh, lubrication measurement is sampling and oil analysis normally either this area is ignored in the industry or it is running very good with a perception that yes everything is right at place we have visited many industries maybe hundreds or more and hardly we found that a lab is properly set up with uh, all the necessary precaution which lead to uh, a correct test result we can buy equipment that is very good we have qualified lab personals still sample results are not much reliable there are few reasons already um, hi highlighted here first one is sampling method by which method we are taking the sample and from which point we are taking the sample whether we are taking from the bottom of the tank top of the tank mid of the tank near to wall from the center of the tank you know, the sampling location is vital whether we are taking sampling uh, sample from the return oil line or supply oil line then method of sampling there is iso standard for sampling method in which the chances of environmental contamination addition is minimal suppose we open a bottle and we take sample from a drain point till the bottle is filled it is in contact with surrounding air so uh, oil is continuously getting contaminated since, since it is exposed to contaminated uh, um, surrounding so that sample even if we test in the lab the result will not be exact reflection of the oil condition available inside the tank then sampling bottles we cannot take sample in a water bottle or something like that a normal bottle there is iso standard for the bottle for the critical equipment we have to maintain nas class like four three or two for that we have to use super clean bottle or ultra clean bottles the equipment which are not very critical they are in normal range like uh, some gear boxes of low rpm something then we can use some normal uh, sam sampling bottles so first we have to define the person who is going to take the sample is he aware about the sampling method and the sampling kit he is carrying is suitable for uh, the sampling for that particular equipment if we have to uh, take a drop tube sample then he should be equipped with a drop tube then that drop tube needs to be flushed to take to uh, go for another sample 
like that he should be trained properly and also we have to keep our watch that this rule uh, should not be violated at any point of time then it comes analysis of the report yes we have taken every precaution well we, we have tested carefully we got the result now comes to interpretation of the values if we are getting uh, ns12 or ns11 immediately we should not be panic after seeing the result we have to analyze that whether this result what we obtained is acceptable by the test method or not there may be some suppose air bubble came in between testing process it will show you ns12 or i i so 2219 then it doesn't mean that oil is that much contaminated we have to see the particle distribution if particle distribution is uh, as it should be like inverted tree or pyramid shape then uh, we can say that we have to go for the retest and we have to do another test to ensure that the first test uh, report is supported by another method as well this is a very vast subject sometime we will have webinar on separately on this topic analysis of reports yeah suggested practices uh, here we can see that uh, for a effective oil analysis program there are four pillars first one is maximizing the data density suppose we have a particle counter we are checking the particle and at last it is showing ns8 that data itself is not dense enough what are the part particle ranges and what is their distribution pattern what type of filtration method we have to choose we can select only based on data density next point will be data disturbance how to minimize like uh, uh, we saw in the last slide that air bubble or moisture can disturb the actual data outcome so how to minimize them we can use uh, bubble rupture method vacuuming method there are various method to uh, avoid data disturbance then consistency of our equipment for the same sample we can test three times four times just to check whether our equipment is able to give consistent result or not then maximize relevance it is just that uh, suppose uh, we got ns9 and we should have ns6 for the as per oem recommendation then we have to see why this ns9 is coming if it is uh, for the less than 5 micron particle and our equipment is like turbine then nothing to worry so what is the relevance of that data that needs to be uh, interpreted and here we can see that for the sampling we have iso 1171 it is also for calibration of particle counters then for the bottle cleanliness we have iso 3722 like that we we have to follow these standard to get appropriate result and uh, to validate our test method next slide please uh, so coming to contamination uh, we have seen a various type of contaminants and uh, when we talk about the solid contamination so solid solid contamination alone <coughs> is not because of dust particle because it varies industry to industry if we go to coal handling plant we can get the carbon particles if we go for a ceramic tiles making plant we can get silica dust 
so solid contamination may be of different variety and their impact also varies then when coming to uh moisture contamination it is not alone the water the liquid may be in the form of acid as well some soluble varnish also so these contamination have different impact like uh, few are mentioned here scuffing or sludge formation rusting like that cavitation so as per uh, details survey done by a very reputed agency 70% of premature failure are contributed to contamination machine failure is just not the bearing failure suppose your contamination contaminated oil enters into the bearing your vibration level will go high high vibration may lead failure of the shaft failure of the fan fan blade failure of the gears there may be failure of any component but when we go to the root it will be just one point contaminated oil which entered into the bearing so contamination is linked with the component in which they they are weighted or they are in contact with the oil as well as contamination is related to the component which are linked with the uh, oil dipped components like bearing ball bearing general bearing bushes or gears next slide uh we will uh, see the contamination control strategy in very detail today so whenever we talk about the machine reliability or methodology or the new maintenance practices like uh, we are use, adapting rcm reliability centered maintenance or sometime we go for uh, cbm condition based maintenance whatever the program is it must be a start from controlling the failure and to control the failure if we go for perito analysis just by controlling the contamination of lubricant the 70% of failure can be eliminated so normally we follow 80 20 ratio this will be surprising that uh, a single component can reduce the failure by 70% by just controlling the contamination of lubricant then uh, in this program what we can do first step will be let's avoid contamination or how to prevent uh, contaminant to enter into the lubricant then what should be our minimum cleanness target if we take suppose we have to maintain na6 and it goes to na7 then immediately we have to do filtration may not be much cost effective so we have to define a range from 6 to 8 we can run okay acceptable then contamination control program in this uh, we have to analyze the entire process from storage handling to top up and service of the oil at which point contaminants are getting uh, enter in, into the oil and how to plug that gap then condition monitoring strategies and nowadays uh, even for the lubricant we have uh, online uh, condition monitoring equipments available so by sitting in the control room itself we can check the healthiness of our equipment in terms of temperature vibration as well as the lubricant condition and we can set up the alarm that can give us uh, very advanced information prior to failure next slide please now coming to importance of oil reconditioning till now we were talking about the uh, prevention of contaminants and then 
if oil is getting contaminated how to remove now we will see what is the importance of removal just to save the oil or just to uh, see that okay we have achieved the our uh, cleanness target we can see few listed point here few are general point like oil life will get extended machine will be reliable cost saving <clears throat> low low carbon emission and the last one and most important is sustainable development because every drop of oil which is entering into the earth is mm, getting mixed with the water and water gets contaminated first it will come under soil pollution later on it will convert it into water pollution then disposal of the oil itself is hazardous way and uh, even we burn the waste oil we are adding carbon to the atmosphere uh, we are contributing to the global warming so reconditioning of the oil is not alone related to the cost or reliability but it is for our sustainability sustainability of the human being our upcoming generation next slide please. yeah so i would like to hand hand over uh, up a uh, session to mr anshuman now and uh, thank you for your patient listening thank you so much mr yogesh so i'll be taking forward from here we have a poll question and uh, the poll is all on your screen gentlemen and ladies uh, oil reclamation is necessary for which one of the following purposes so please uh, chip in with your responses uh, whether it is for uh, saving the money or reliability of the equipment or sustainable development or all of the above what do you feel oil reclamation or oil purification is important for you for so yeah we have the poll results where uh certainly the audience has polled for all of the above uh, people want uh, each of the benefits as listed here they want uh, to save money they want to increase the reliability of the equipment and certainly for the sustainable development so that's really great to know and uh, thereby i must say that the upcoming slides would be much in sync with the thought process of our audience so uh, we would like to discuss about uh, various contaminations which come in the oils and lubrication systems and uh, what are the possible solutions that you can adopt for your plant for your machinery to handle the contamination scenarios so the first one is uh, particulate contamination in my opinion that's one of the easiest contaminants which one can identify and uh, i believe almost all of us would believe that our hydraulic systems or lubrication systems they are susceptible to vulnerable to particulate contamination so hence it is very important for us to identify uh, what is the level of particulate contamination for that uh, we have discussed in past there are uh, techniques called particle counting technique and uh, also patch testing technique so <clears throat> one of the most finest methods for uh, handling the solid particulate contaminations is stage wise uh, mechanical filtration technology why stage wise because uh, particles are possible in multiple sizes and shapes so there would be large sized particles and there would be very fine sized particles so if you want to handle all the particles with just one uh, system or just one filter that possibly would be loading that filter too much and uh, maybe it won't be adequate enough to handle the particles so we suggest you to go for stage wise uh, mechanical filtration technology where you can have uh, large sized microns or coarse micron filters then you can have medium sized filters and finally you can have uh, super fine filters there are also there are some techniques like uh, the electrostatic fine filtration techniques so once you have done the stage wise mechanical filtration you could proceed with electrostatic based uh, 
solid particle separation techniques. The second technique uh, is required for the removal of the contaminants like the moisture contamination. So for removal of the moisture contamination, as well as uh, removal of particulate contamination, both types of contamination together, uh, this is a combo system. And this combo system works on uh, stage-wise mechanical filtration technology, as well as it works on the vacuum dehydration or low vacuum dehydration technology. And uh, this technique or this equipment is used for removal of both solid particles, as well as removal of moisture contamination. Moisture we all know is existent in the oils or anywhere in three forms. The first is the dissolved form because oil, it is uh, uh, able to dissolve. It is hygroscopic in nature. So it is able to dissolve the moisture in it. So hence moisture is present in the dissolved form. Once the saturation point of oil in order to dissolve the uh, water is arrived, then that's called the saturated point or emulsified oil where further dissolution of water is not possible. And uh, if the water is present in non-dissolved form or free form, it is called as free water. So there are three different uh, phases of water contamination in the oil. And this technology that is called the low vacuum dehydration technology, it is uh, suitable for removal of moisture in all the three forms. That's uh, dissolved form, emulsified form, and the free form as well. So it's like a versatile equipment. It can resolve all your problems and all your contamination woos with just one single technique. Now there's another technique, uh, which is a faster technique for removal of water contamination uh, when especially water is present in free form. <clears throat> so a lot of us would have used uh, centrifuge or centrifugal equipment in past, but uh, we also know at the same time that centrifugal techniques uh, or those equipment are very difficult to maintain because of the number of parts, because of the rotary motion, because of wear and tear of various components of that equipment. So maintenance of that equipment itself is very difficult. Although it's a very successful technique, the centrifugal technique, the maintenance is a big headache for everyone. And hence there's a, a technology called uh, liquid liquid coalescing technology. So this coalescing technology is quite different from the water absorption technology. Here the water is not absorbed, but water is separated. Just like you experience water separation in case of a centrifuge, you can experience the water separation by a media called the coalescing. Now this equipment again is suitable for removal of both solid particle contamination, as well as the free water contamination. So if you have heavy contamination of water in your oil uh, to the tune of say 5% uh, or even 10%, you could always go ahead with coalescer based technique so that you can remove the water contamination to less than 100 ppm in a very short time. Because this equipment is very fast uh, and it is suitable for turbine applications or compressor applications, even large sized lube oil tank applications. So this another equipment, it's basically the low vacuum dehydration system as well as a reconditioning system. So many of us would, uh, would have seen that acid contamination is a big concern nowadays because there are certain synthetic fluids where acid formation is a very prone activity. And that happens because of presence of moisture. It happens because of presence of metallic contamination in the oil. And also when the conditions of temperature and pressure are favorable, uh, acid formation in synthetic fluids is very common, especially if you are working in a power plant or uh, a gas turbine uh, power station. So you would find that there are certain synthetic fluids called uh, fire resistant fluids or electrohydraulic fluids, EH oil or DEH oil. 
So for these fluids, uh, tan value or acid number, uh, total acid number, it has become a big concern because if acid values go high, then the entire servo system or the hydraulic system, it stops functioning. There are a lot of breakdown related matters which have been reported by various power stations in various regions. And that's because of acid contamination in the lubricating oil or the hydraulic oil. So in order to get rid of all the types of contamination by one single equipment, uh, this equipment, which you can see on the screen, is capable enough to remove the particulate contamination. It is capable enough to remove the moisture contamination. And at the same time, <clears throat> it is capable to remove acid contamination. If already acid formation has happened, this equipment is a multi reconditioning equipment and it can remove all three types of contaminations from the hydraulic fluid or the lubricating fluid. Coming to the consultancy part, <clears throat> which uh, we have been doing a lot. So there is a program called RILA, whose uh, full form is Reliability Improvement with Lubrication Assessment. So we have understood that lubrication assessment Lubrication reliability is very important for the longevity of our plant and for the sustainable um, optimum operation of our equipment, which are installed in our plant of our assets in the plant. So in order to have a systematic approach towards uh, finding out a solution, towards empowering our people, towards establishing a system and doing all of these based on the current practices, what you have been doing. So that's the approach which uh, RILA program actually adopts, where we need to identify. So we have to find out what are the current practices and what are the gaps from the international standards for your current practices. Based on that, a program would be devised, certain pointers would be established, uh, the teams would be empowered and educated and thereby the ultimate benefit would be to reduce the maintenance cost, to reduce the lubrication concerns and breakdowns for a particular plant. And of course, to improve the equipment uptime. So what are the highlights of this RILA program? So this RILA program would talk about uh, right from the lubrication reception in your plant, it would talk about the, or it would rather cover the topics of storage and handling. It would also optimize the application of lubricants in your plant, wherein if you have multiple types of lubrication being used, then there might be possibilities to optimize the number of lubricants, the quantities of lubricants, the types of lubricants, the make or brands of lubricants. So this program would highlight those as well. The lube room management. We talked about the lube room concept a few slides earlier, and uh, thereby we have understood that the lube room must be established in any plant, whether you have uh, less variety of lubricants being used or very high varieties of lubricants implemented in your plant. You need to have a dedicated lube room. So, in order to establish a lube room, in order to uh, identify what will be the structure of the lube room, where it would be located, what configuration it would have, how it would be managed, how the existing maintenance teams would interact with the lube room personals. So all these activities will be a part of this RILA program. Then there are contamination control strategies. We have seen that multiple plants uh, do spend a lot over contamination control, but probably that can be optimized. At the same time, there are plants or there are industries where people have been totally ignorant about what is contamination control. And in the absence of knowledge about contamination control, they go ahead spending a lot of money towards lubrication related breakdowns and lubrication changes. So contamination control strategies can be defined. Oil analysis program or OAP, which is very important in today's world, because that would help you to identify the life of your lubricant and further 
uh, possibility of usage of the lubricant. So that's also very important. And last but not the least, the lube disposal and waste management. So lubricants are normally hazardous for the environment and we all being ISO standard organizations, lube disposal and management of the waste lubricant is very important. So that also is a part of this RILA program. So along with the entire program, consultancy, ideas generation, we would also like to offer you certain accessories which are helpful towards the development of the lube practices in your plant. And these would be a part of the lube room. So that's all from our side. Thank you so much for being a patient audience. I hope we have sensitized the audience enough with the topics which we have covered today. Although it was a very general topic about general lubrication systems, uh, I am sure that our audience has gained a lot of information from the talk uh, during the last few minutes. Thank you so much, audience. And uh, over to you, Jhumpa, to take the proceedings ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, it was such a great and informative session. Uh, so hello, everyone. I am Jhumpa Mukherjee, brand and media manager at Minimax Systems. Today, I'm here to make some amazing announcements. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank each one of you for being a part of uh, our webinar series. And um, uh, I'm glad that you liked uh, our webinar series so much and uh, our season one of webinar series, uh, you have make it, uh, made it a huge success. Um, so um, uh, you showed us with uh, many uh, nice comments and appreciation. Uh, whenever we came online. So on behalf of Minimac and team webinar, I would like to thank uh, you all for your contributions. Um, with today's webinar, we have successfully completed 13 webinars covering so many important topics, which would not have been possible without our experts, uh, Mr. Anshuman Agrawal, Mr. Yogesh Kumar, Ms. Pulkita, uh, Rohila Zaidu, and other experts, and of course, our uh, guest speakers. Um, so uh, we have uh, many big plans and exciting plans for the year 2022. Um, uh, during pandemic, we had started uh, this webinar series and uh, uh, for which we have got enormous response. And we had also launched a global WhatsApp community for lubricant and reliability professionals, uh, which is also a huge success. Uh, with your uh, support, we had expand uh, our um, vision towards zero mechanical breakdown and i believe together we can achieve it uh, so we will continue to create uh, and spread awareness towards lubrication excellence and uh, of course uh, we will be back with season two of webinar series next year um, packed with more knowledge um, more case studies, practical approach, and lots more. So we are not leaving you here. Uh, you'll get a chance to win um, uh, many goodies, prizes, and sorry, I can't reveal more. Uh, so you have to stay tuned uh, with us and join our WhatsApp community uh, to get all the updates regarding the same. So you'll get um, uh, the joining link in the chat box. So I would request you all to join our WhatsApp community group and subscribe uh, so that you get regular updates from us. Um, so before I pass on uh, the platform uh, to my colleague, I would like to wish you all uh, a very happy holiday season, Merry Christmas and a prosperous new year. Um, and now I would like to request uh, my colleague Pragati to move ahead with Q&A session with our experts and uh, I, I shall see you all soon and uh, don't forget to stay tuned for more updates regarding the same. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Zumba. Uh, now uh, we'll have the great Q&A session. So for that, I would like to request our respected panelist, Mr. Anshuman Agarwal and Mr. Yogesh Kumar, sir, 
to please switch on their videos and uh, we'll have the session now. So now I'm going to take the first question for the evening. So the first question is by Vip, Mr. Vipul Panchal and the, and the question is, what is MPC method and how we can do? So whosoever likes to get the question, proceed, please. Okay, so I'll take the question about MPC and varnish. So MPC is a method for identifying the varnish potential in a particular lubricant. The full form of MPC is membrane patch colorimetry. Uh, this happens using a 0.45 micron membrane patch through which the oil sample is passed. The filter uh, deposits, which are on the top of the membrane, their color actually defines a number and that number is called the MPC. So what you actually do is you compare the condition of your current sample with the condition of a new oil, which is having possibly a very whiter patch color. So when you do this, you identify what is the difference of the color. And there is a equipment called the MPC meter or the MPC device with which you can identify the difference of color of the patches. So it's a very simple test. It would hardly take you to conduct this test five minutes and you can organize it in your site as well. You don't need a, a defined laboratory for that. And uh, you can perform it at site in your office or even on the go near your machine. So it's one of the simplest tests, uh, doesn't come at very high cost. And uh, if you wish, uh, even Minimac team can help you to support towards uh, defining the MPC values for varnish potential in your plant. Okay, that was an interesting answer. Thank you, sir. So the next question is from Mr. Manuel. And the question is, crackle test has been mentioned as a reference for 500 ppm of water, mm -hmm. but, but isn't it depending on the oil type and also on the application? Sometimes is not a valid test. So crackle uh -huh. test is not an exact test. It's like a go no go test. And more often it is considered not as a laboratory test, but only as a site detection test. So for this test, you don't require much of apparatus. You just require few drops of oil sample and the instrument, which doesn't cost much. Uh, with this instrument, you can identify if your oil is having moisture level more than 500 ppm or not. So that's just like a go no go test. If the oil is having higher contamination of ppm, then yes, you need to take some action towards it. If you want to define what method you would like to go ahead for during the for doing the purification or doing the water separation possibly you would have to go for a detailed lab analysis once you have identified uh, heavy moisture in your oil through the crackle test however if the crackle test shows uh, either zero levels or it shows very less levels of moisture in the oil then possibly you can uh, continue to use your equipment without further detailed analysis because 500 ppm is the threshold value at which the crackle test works. Thank you, sir. So we'll take the next question. And the question is from Mr. Salgado. Do you recommend NAS class for different use of the oil? Example, servo wells. Uh I would like to so, take this question. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, see, uh, first we have to see the OEM re recommendation of the oil uh, cleanness class, whether it is NAS 5 or 6. But as a general statement, definitely we can say for the servo valve, NS 5 or better is good. For uh, some very critical servo valve, NAS 
NAS one or two is also recommended. So we have to see for which particular valve uh, we we are looking for, and uh, for every different equipment, there are uh, different operating conditions. Based on those condition, we define the oil cleanness level or NS class. Would you like to add something, Mr. Afriman? So you have uh, rightly targeted it that uh, NS would depend upon the application. And uh, yeah, really, there are applications of servo walls where you have to go ahead with NAS 1 and 2 as well when it comes to supercritical applications of hydraulics. Uh, apart from servo walls, uh, we might also have bearings in our lubrication systems, or we might have uh, hydraulic cylinders, proportionate walls, or even simple walls like DC walls and relief walls. Now, NAS class is one of the parameters which can help you to identify what is going to go wrong in future with your equipment or your components. So if you are having a hydraulic system and possibly you are having a, a condition where pressure is not getting developed for the system, then you can easily say that the NAS class has gone up and the contaminants have actually choked up the relief valve. So this is something which is very common whenever you talk about hydraulic power packs or hydraulic power units. Uh, this relief valve choking is a very common practice. And uh, even if you have got a very simple hydraulic system, relief valve is something which is a mandatory part of any hydraulics throughout the world. So NAS class checking is highly recommended if you have hydraulic systems or lubrication systems. And defining the class of NAS which you would like to follow is also very important based on the application which you are experiencing in your plant. Okay, thank you, sir, for the answer. So we'll take up the next question. And the question is from Mr. Kishan. Kindly suggest which type of lubricant used in non-ferrous alloys tube drawing process. Uh, for suggesting any lubricant for your application, just uh, that equipment name is not sufficient because uh, uh, that equipment uh, may be of very small capacity or maybe of very large capacity. So parameters will definitely vary. So for, for the wire drawing, it may be for the point mm wire drawing or it may be wire drawing of 25 mm size. So for the 25 mm size, there will be huge pressure and temperature rise. So lubricant selection will definitely vary. So we need to detail information about the equipment before concluding any specific lubricant for that equipment. Okay, thank you, sir. And the next question is from Mr. Malge. And the question is, what is the life of lubrication? So if you are talking about the lubricant oil, it's really a very interesting question because we have been propagating the fact that a lubricant has got indefinite life. Yes, it's a very bold statement. And I'm sure there would be a lot of eyebrows which will be raised when I say a lubricant has indefinite life. But the writer is that a lubrication system or a lubricant can really have an indefinite life subject to the condition that the lubricant has been maintained to the proper level of cleanliness uh, throughout its workable or usable life. So right from the stage when you charge the lubricant and you install or start up your lubrication system, right from that stage, if you can perform the best practices, and then through the life of the lubricant or the equipment, the life cycle is ensured that the lubricant has been maintained in a clean scenario. The environment around it has been very decent and clean. So it's not an impossible task. And we have seen 
the life of lubricants increasing from five to six times at various plants where the best practices of lubricants have been adopted. So although it might not be an indefinite life, which has been seen by many personals or professionals around, but a five to six times increase in the life of lubricant, then increase the uptime of the equipment by 25 to 30%, reduction in the maintenance costs by 30 to 40%. So these parameters are themselves an indicative that yes, if you can maintain your lubricant properly, you can actually achieve a lot towards the life cycle improvement of the entire asset, not just the lubricant, but the entire asset of your plant. I would like to add something in this. Yeah, please go. Uh, if you take an example of bearing, it is calculated on L10 scale where, where its life is 10 lakhs running hour. And unfortunately, almost 90% of the bearing uh, never go beyond 20,000 of running hour. So you can compare whether 10 lakh running hour or 20,000 running hour. It's totally on the maintenance and uh, oil conditioning. Thank you, sir. That was an insightful answer. So, and the next question is uh, from Mr. El Asri. And the question is, what is the difference between aeration and cavitation, please? Aeration uh, is a phenomena and uh, cavitation is outcome. When the anti-foaming property or de deformant of uh, an oil gets depleted, then uh, certainly a uh, high volume of foam will occur in the oil. And when uh, these foam or water bubble uh, enters into the high pressure zone, they burst. And impact of bursting causes almost 5,000 PSI pressure at less than one square mm area. So it will peel off the material or it will uh, make a small dip. That is called cavitation. So one is reason, another is outcome. Okay, sir. Uh, so the next question is asked by Mr. Amir. The question is, how many types of air breathers or reservoirs do we have? And which air breather is better than the other one? Hmm. Good question. Because breathers are no, normally really um, much ignorant area. Uh, even uh, we take care of the lubrication system, but we give least priority to breathers. And those are as important as our nose in our body. So, <clears throat> and if we talk about the type of breathers, uh, mostly they are customized based on the application. Yeah, and uh, not only application, as well as uh, the surrounding of that machine. If surrounding is very dusty, we can go for multi-layer breathers. If uh, the machine has to ap operate near the coastal area, then it should have capability to trap moisture. So we can go for silica gel based or membrane based breathers. So, so certainly, uh, how many types of breathers are just like how many types of humans are there in the world? Okay, sir. Uh, that was a <clears throat> great answer. <laughs> so the next question is uh, by Mr. Krishnamurti. And the question goes like, what is the recommended water content in the hydraulic oil? The straightaway answer from my side would be mm -hmm. zero. But uh, that's something which is uh, very difficult or rather impossible to achieve because water is not a part of any hydraulic or lubrication system unless you are using a particular fluid which is water-based. 
certain yes, water based hydraulic fluids as well so we would not be talking about those because they would have 95% of water content and that's by design so as per your question i can understand you're talking about mineral oil based uh, hydraulic oil systems where uh, ideally you should have no water content but there are sources of water or moisture in the system like there is the breather which we talked about just now there are leakages in various hydraulic components like uh, hydraulic cylinders pumps various valves then there is the tank header space which is normally humid in nature and that tank header space carries the atmospheric air which is humid so even that is a source of contamination water into your hydraulic system the recommended value which normally all the oems suggest that's around 100 ppm for any hydraulic system so anything beyond 100 ppm is not preferred the moment you increase the moisture level or you allow it to accumulate beyond 100 ppm you are vulnerable to have acid contamination increase in the hydraulic system then you are also uh, prone towards having a emulsified hydraulic oil very soon because the moment the water contamination starts increasing in the hydraulic oil there would be a stage where a saturation point of further dissolution of water in oil would reach and that's called the emulsified level that is the stage where you would actually notice by your naked eye that your hydraulic system has got moisture because unless the water level goes beyond the saturation point it would be completely transparent and if you draw a sample of oil from your system and you visibly see it by naked eye you would be under an impression that there is no moisture contamination unless you actually test it in a laboratory or you test it using a crackle test or your laboratory device so i hope this elaborate explanation has uh, given you some insight about water contamination in hydraulic oils sure sir so the next question is by mr anu he wants to know that what is the oil grade range for which lube oil filter machine can be offered by minimac so we had talked about certain technologies which are useful for uh, doing the filtration and uh, separation of contaminants from the oil the oil grade or the viscosity grade you want to say is uh, uh, not actually limited for the minimac team because uh, we have been offering solutions up to 1000 centi stokes oil viscosity as well so right from viscosity ranges of 1 cst a solution can be offered up to 1000 cst grade uh, or viscosity for the oil so there are applications in power plants where 1000 uh, oil grade is also used this includes the gear oil range the lubrication oil range it includes the hydraulic range the lube oil range or the turbine oil range so all the grades of oil which you can think of up to 1000 cst is something it is regularly offered to the clients apart from that if you have certain special grades which are beyond 1000 cst a custom built solution can be offered which uh, would call for a detailed understanding of the application the detailed study of the oil and based on that a solution can be offered okay thank you sir and uh, we'll take the next question uh, from uh, mr islam and the question is what are the preferred test methods for testing grease Mr. Yogesh, you can take up the question. Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, grease uh, testing is uh, itself uh, 
very vast subject and the entire station will be not sufficient to uh, answer this but uh, basic test what we do is uh, consistency test or drop test what we do and since this is used in very small quantity so for the regular maintenance we often uh, go for replacement of grease as it is consumed like 4 4 5 grams or 10 10 grams but but if it is used uh, if it is used in bulk quantity then uh, we have uh, certain test method to see that uh, how fast grease will release uh, its uh, oil or lubricant and the residue hardness test so um, certainly in the upcoming season we will keep one webinar dedicatedly for grease lubrication as we are getting many requests regarding the grease lubrication thank you sir yeah that's great uh, so we'll take uh, the next question asked by mr parmar and the question is what are the turbine lube oil and EH oil parameter to be monitored to improve the life of turbine uh, BRG? Bearing. Okay. Bearing. So we have a detailed <clears throat> article which has been published in one of our blogs. I would request the admin to uh, share the link of the blogs for uh, lube oil analysis for turbine as well as the electrohydraulic oil related uh, testing standards. But for the benefit of the audience out here, I can tell that there are certain basic tests and certain detailed tests. The basic tests must be performed on a very regular basis, preferably in your own laboratory. If you can establish testing standards for solid particulate contamination, which reports in NAS 1638, or ISO 4406, so that's one, that is solid particulate distribution. The second test which you can establish is moisture level, which is reported in PPM, parts per million. The third test you need to organize especially for the EH oil parameter, and that's called the total acid number. It's reported in MG KOH per gram, and that defines the amount of acid which is present already in your EH oil. So these are the three tests which are highly important. And these are the primary parameters or primary indicatives which give you an understanding what's happening around with your oil. However, there are many other detailed tests which I would not like to miss out, like the elemental analysis, the resistivity analysis for especially the EH oil, anti-foment uh, agent analysis, then there is a demulsification characteristic, especially for the lube oil, because uh, it is uh, prone to having a lot of free water in it. So uh, it needs to have a demulsibility characteristic as well. So there are many other such parameters which you need to test. But uh, as I mentioned, there are certain set of regular parameters and there are some certain set of special parameters which you need to define. And follow a program of oil analysis accordingly. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is asked by Mr. Anonymous. And the question is, how can we avoid contamination ingression by using an air breather? I think this question is answered a few questions back and still okay. one thing i would like to repeat that uh, see the source of contamination and type of contamination accordingly we can customize the breather and that will be the most suitable for a particular application okay thank you sir so uh, the next question is by mr rizwan and he wants to know what is the main difference between NAS, uh, NAS 1638 and ISO 4406? How ISO 4406 is better than NAS 1638? Please define. 
So yeah, this is a big uh, question by everyone, uh, every lubrication expert, which standard to follow, which one is better? Now, I would like to clarify that there is no competition between standards. These standards or these guidelines rather, they have been defined by various organizations uh, who are experts in best practices for lubrication systems. So ISO 4406, as the name suggests, it is defined by the ISO organization, its International Standards Organization. They have defined a lot of standards around a lot of processes, around a lot of parameters and manufacturing related applications, quality systems, environmental systems, almost everything. Even in recent times for COVID, a lot of ISO standards were released by the body ISO. It has headquarters in Europe. NS is a standard which specializes towards hydraulic systems, uh, especially when they are hydraulic systems for aerospace related applications. And as the name suggests, NAS is National Aerospace Standard, and that's used by NASA Organization of the United States of America. And they have defined it for their aerospace program for all the hydraulic systems, which were used in the aerospace program of NASA. Now that standard became a world known, a world popular standard wherever hydraulic systems were being used because everyone tends to follow the best. And we all certainly agree that NASA of USA has been one of the pioneers towards aerospace standards. So this is the advent or origin of both the standards. So as I mentioned earlier, NAS is mostly used for hydraulic systems because most of the hydraulic OEMs, they have been following that standard. ISO 4406 is much more a versatile standard organization. So they have not defined this standard just for the hydraulic systems, but they have rather done it for almost all the applications of lubrication. So nowadays you can see a lot of OEMs who have been defining your requirement of cleanliness parameter in terms of ISO 4406. And that has become a much more versatile, acceptable and known standard around the globe. However, if you talk about certain regions or certain industries, which have been following the hydraulic standards for them, NAS 1638, still remains one of the most acceptable ones. But there's no competition in between them as both of them talk about particulate contamination. Both of them talk about the size of the particles and the number of the particles. So they are both classification standards for size and number of solid particulate contamination in your fluids. Uh, that was a great answer, sir. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Sharma. And uh, the question is, the, what is maximum allowed temperature to avoid the degradation of turbine duplication oil? Yeah. Uh, when we say about the maximum allowed temperature, first point will be that what temperature is defined by the oil manufacturer that will be around 110 degrees celsius then what temperature is recommended by the turbine manufacturer or turbine bearing manufacturer that is around 105 degrees celsius in the case of bevit coated journal bearing so in general practice of steam turbine and gas turbine we don't go beyond 105 degrees Celsius. And in case of hydro turbine, limits are different. We don't go beyond 85 degrees Celsius. But if you are talking about any specific turbine of any particular application, we need details to define the limits. OK, thank you, sir. Now, the last question for the evening 
is by Mr. Vishal. And the question is, explain the difference between mineral oil and synthetic oil. So as the name suggests, the mineral oils have an origin, which is natural origin. So they get formed from the base oil, which uh, is extracted through the oil and gas exploration and drilling process. So once the base oil comes out of the crude oil, it is blended with multiple additives to form various viscosities of oils. Synthetic oils, uh, as compared to mineral oils, they are first of all not uh, naturally available. They are produced by certain uh, chemical reactions in manufacturing plants. What is the purpose of procuring synthetic oils as compared to mineral oils? Mineral oils have got limited scope in terms of uh, maneuverability towards the parameters of mineral oils. For example, viscosity index. That's one of a very important parameters for uh, a stable viscosity for the oil application. Now, viscosity index is fixed for mineral oils. It doesn't vary much. It's certainly something which is as available naturally. Whereas when it comes the case of synthetic oils, uh, as it is being manufactured by chemical companies, the viscosity index can be actually planned, defined, and it can be manufactured according to the need of the user or the application. Similarly, there are parameters like oxidation number, there are parameters like uh, the life of the oil, the lubrication application of the oil. So all of these can be specially defined and uh, manufactured according to the needs of a particular equipment. So if you are working with compressors or maybe engines, so you would find a very common application for synthetic oils in these applications nowadays. Whereas if you have regular steam turbines or regular hydraulic systems, you would find more of mineral oil applications in those equipment and assets. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir, uh, for your answer. So now, as uh, we came to the end of the season one, I hope to see you all in our next season. And we are coming up with uh, great things. And so keep uh, keep you keep waiting. And uh, we are excited for the new session. And don't feel disheartened if your question has not been answered. We'll surely share the FAQ on our uh, uh, platforms. And uh, your, your, your answers will be there. And now um, I would like to thank our respective panelists for their uh, interactive session and uh, knowledge packed session. And I hope everyone everyone will get the valuable uh, knowledge from this session. So thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone.